when stress is high, uh, it helps when someone is confident in you. I was thinking about this with regard to athletics. I guess there's a football game this afternoon. Those of us from Cleveland will be rooting for Team Ohio, and um, we'll see how it goes. I've never watched a team that I care about play in a meaningful championship game. So it's a whole new experience. I, I hope things go well. And I was reflecting on my own uh, storied athletic career and was wondering if there was ever a moment where a coach came out to me in a stressful situation uh, and said, hey, I, I'm confident in you. Uh, you are the person who I want to take this shot. You are the person who I want to make the block. I believe in you. You can do it. And, and in point of fact, that is also not an experience that I've had in my playing career, but I did have it in my coaching career. I will tell you a story that I had forgotten since 1987, and I feel nervous about this being online, but it's okay. Uh, I have friends who are lawyers. Uh, in, uh, in high school, in the high school that I went to, um, Here's how it went. We, we had a couple of sports. We had football and basketball, and we had baseball. You could run track if, if you were skilled that way. Uh, and I obviously didn't run track. Uh, I played football, and I also loved to play baseball. That was my favorite sport was baseball. And I uh, um, played my freshman year and my sophomore year. And uh, my baseball nickname, as I've shared previously, was Meals on Wheels. So if your baseball nickname is Meals on Wheels, then what happens uh, when you are a junior is the coach comes to you and he says, hey, I think football's the sport for you. I think you should spend more time in the weight room. Don't worry about that baseball stuff. And so I got the message and uh, I dedicated my spring to weightlifting. But here's what happened. The girls freshman softball coach quit. And the athletic director came to me in the weight room, I believe, and he said, hey, we need a freshman girls softball coach. This is such a bad idea. You could only do this in the 1980s. You couldn't do this today. Um, and, and so he said, we will give you a faculty member who will be the official coach. And this faculty member knows nothing about sports ball. And you will be the freshman girls softball coach. And so myself, with all of my high school junior maleness and all of my high school junior male footballness, was the freshman girls softball coach. And uh, it was intense. And um, it was great. And uh, there was a moment at the end of the season when we were playing in the tournament where uh, we were... Uh, it was the end of the game. It was the kind of moment that you dream about being. You have a spot to win. Uh, you're up by a run or two. The other team loads the bases, and, and they are hitting our pitcher like crazy at this point in the game. And I only have a couple of, of young ladies who can get the ball to the plate. And so I, I need to make a pitching change. And so I go out there, and this is like, you know, the mid-80s, right? I'm like Tommy Lasorda. I'm like going, which is a name that some of you will recognize and others of you can Google. And I, I go out to make the pitching change, and I bring in the other girl who can get the ball to the plate. And, and um, she, she gets to the, 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 the pitching area. It's not really a mound. And I, and I give her the ball. I remember her name, but I'm not going to say it. And I'm like, here you go. There's no one that I would rather have in this situation. You are the right person for this job. You can do this. And I am pumping her up exactly the way that my football coach would have pumped us up. And, uh, and she did not care. <laughs> But she got the person out, and we won the game, and I felt like Tommy Lasorda. And, and then, you know, it was awkward because they're all hugging in the middle of the field, and you can't do that. I mean, we even knew you can't do that in the 1980s, but we won, and it was a great moment uh, in, you know, great stressful, all of that to say, in a stressful moment, it really helps when there is a person who is confident in you confident in you. 
And that, I think, is, is the main point uh, that we get out of the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, because the Christians who received this written-down sermon called Hebrews were in a very, very stressful moment. We know more about the moment that they're in, actually from verses later in the letter that we haven't gotten to yet in chapter 10, uh, because we learn in chapter 10, if you have a Bible, you can flip there. It's about 10, chapter, verse 30, chapter 10, verse 32. We learn that this is a church that had previously undergone persecution at some point in the past. Uh, the writer, uh, the preacher writes to them, after you were enlightened, so after you'd believed the gospel, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. They'd been happy to identify with Christians jailed for their faith. They had their property confiscated, and now they've come to a moment sometime later where the stress is even higher, the stakes are even higher. It might move from property confiscation to imprisonment, and it might, and if, if we are right in understanding that this relates to the person persecution by the emperor Nero of the Roman church in AD 62, then uh, it might actually lead to their execution, that this was something that was happening in Rome at the time. So the stakes were very, very, very high. And the pastor wants his Christian readers to be resilient under stress, to not drift spiritually. His pastoral goal is for them to make it to the finish line of their lives. And what he wants to do is for them to derive confidence from their leader, confidence from Jesus. And he describes this in verses 14, 15, 16 of chapter 4, where he really gives two rallying cries to the church. Each rallying cry starts with the expression, let us. So listen to it as I reread verse 14 to 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. That's the first rally cry. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, this is the second rally cry, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, so when the pressure comes, what the preacher wants the Christian readers to do is to resist by holding fast to our confession. Let us hold fast to what we have professed publicly, that we are with Jesus. Hold fast to that. And then secondly, let us then draw confidence, that with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. Hold fast to what we believe. Draw near to the God who has grace to give. The preacher doesn't just tell us in the verses that we'll consider how to resist drift. He then motivates us uh, by why we can resist drift. Why can we be confident that we can hold fast? Why can we be confident that we can draw near to the throne of grace? I think that this is an important question. We'll look at each of them. We'll look at the how and the why. That'll be the two points of the sermon. Uh, but it's interesting, and I just want to point out to you in advance, that the preacher's solution for our confidence when pressure comes is different than the confidence that I tried to give that young freshman softball pitcher. The confidence that I tried to give that young pitcher, the confidence that your coach might try to give you, something like this. Dig down deeper inside of yourself. Find resources inside of yourself. Find your grit your determination, your mental toughness, whatever you need, look inside of yourself for the resources that you already possess in order to face this stressful moment. What the preacher does is something different. Rather than inviting the Christians to dig deeper into themselves, he invites them to look more clearly at Jesus, to understand Jesus better in this stressful moment. And particularly what he wants us to do is to be confident that we can hold fast to what we believe and we can draw near to the throne of grace because of the greatness of Jesus as our high priest. That what Jesus does as high priest for the Christian church is our source of confidence when we face pressure to drift spiritually. So first, the how question, how to resist drift with confidence hold fast and draw near. 
and then the why. Let us hold fast to our confession. Hold fast describes uh, adherence to, to, in order to maintain life. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it's uh, the word that Paul uses to describe how the Christian church needs to remain attached to Christ the head. That, that the Christian church needs to adhere to Christ the head in order to live spiritually through the challenges of their day. And so the first exhortation to the church is to hold fast to our confession of faith. And in fairness, we need, we need to recognize this is to hold fast to your public confession of faith. So that's the, the first thing that we need to take with us, that um, the writer of Hebrews is not speaking to Christians who have privatized their faith. That's such a challenge, I think, in our culture that our culture invites us to privatize our faith. It kind of goes like this. It's okay for you to believe in Jesus as long as you keep it to yourself. As long as your faith in Jesus doesn't rock the boat, as long as your faith in Jesus doesn't uh, impede on my life and how I want to live my life, you can have a privatized faith. Just keep it quiet. We'll permit the, the trees and the lights at Christmas time, but otherwise private. That was not an option for the Christians who received the letter of the Hebrews. You can't have a privatized Christian faith. They were facing big pressure because they were publicly committed to Jesus. And I, I was thinking this week about the witness of a, a pastor who you may have heard of. And if you are watching the Olympics uh, this time around, I haven't gotten into the Winter Olympics this year uh, because it doesn't involve coaching freshman girls softball. And um, but if you do, you might want to pause and pray for Pastor Wang Yi of Early Rain Covenant Church. You might have heard his name. He is the pastor of a Presbyterian-type house church in China, and he has been in prison since December 2018. And I went online to see if there were any updates from his church. There are not any updates from his church uh, within our de denomination, we, so, we know some individuals who have ministered to that church in the past. And uh, I was thinking about the kind of pressure that those Christians face for being public about their faith and how we don't really face that same kind of pressure right now. Probably the kind of pressure that we face is being more, is more relational than what, that when we're public about our Christian faith in our relationship world. And more on this in a moment. Because I think, and, and think along with me, that as the gospel goes forward over the next couple of years, more and more men and women are going to come to faith from not Christian backgrounds. That might be your story. And if it's true, I'm really glad that you're here. And you will understand even more than me how challenging it is to, to become a public Christian when your family of origin is not Christian and your friend group is not Christian. And you start to do things where you publicly identify as Christians. You, you might come for baptism and publicly identify as a Christian. Uh, you might start to share your faith publicly and identify as a Christian. Uh, your Christian faith may influence your vocational choices. Uh, it may influence all kinds of choices in your life. And you might have no one in your world who really understands that. And so you might really experience some relationship pressure. And what you need to know when that pressure comes is that Jesus is a compassionate high priest. And the preacher highlights the ministry of Jesus, our high priest, so that we can hold fast. And we'll get to the whys in a moment, but let me show you the next how exhortation. He wants us to hold fast, uh, to remain true to our public profession. And then he wants us, verse 16, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, if, if you're a Bible underliner, this is a good verse to underline. You could at least underline, you don't have to, I'm not going to check, uh, but you could underline the throne of grace phrase. Some of you are doing it. It's very affirmative. <laughs> This is the only place in the Bible where the expression throne of grace occurs. 
The reason I know this is I have a computer program where I can look up every word in the Bible, and I did. And I thought, you know, what the people really want to know on Super Bowl Sunday is how is God's throne described in the Bible? Here are a few representative phrases. God's throne is described as a throne of justice and righteousness. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He's established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. This is good news when we want justice. This is a warning when we deserve justice. God's throne is a throne of righteousness and justice. God's throne is holy. Psalm 47, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Righteousness, justice, holiness. God is righteous. He is just. He is holy. He's completely fair. He can't be paid off. He's not swayed by wealth or influence. He's entirely morally pure. All of this is important, but if we're honest, it can also be somewhat intimidating. Because sometimes, especially when there's pressure to drift spiritually, we're aware of our sin. We're aware of places where we've been unjust. And coming before this throne of righteousness and justice and holiness can sound scary. But in my survey in the Old Testament, I also observed this, that in Isaiah 6, in that famous vision that that some of you will recognize where Isaiah the prophet has a vision of the Lord in his throne room. And in his vision, he hears angels calling to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in this encounter and experience of the Lord's holiness, Isaiah the prophet becomes aware of his sinfulness. When he encounters all that God is, he realizes all that he isn't. And in that moment in the vision, what does he encounter? He encounters grace and mercy because angels come to him with a coal from the altar and they apply the coal to his lips symbolically so that he experiences atonement and forgiveness. So there is a moment in the Old Testament where the throne of justice and the throne of righteousness and the throne of holiness becomes also a throne of grace. And there's one more vision, which won't be immediately obvious to most of us. It's in the prophet Zechariah, less known to us, perhaps, where God gives the prophet a vision of a future day. In this vision, the prophet sees a king who would come, a king nicknamed the Branch, which is a nickname for the Messiah, God's final king. And this is how the vision plays out. Behold, this man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from this place and he shall build the temple of the Lord as he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor. So he's a king and shall sit and rule on his throne and there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. It's a vision of a king and a priest working together to bring peace to God's people. Hold that thought. I mean, if you really want to do something awesome, hold it for a week because we're going to explain this more in a week. Like a week? I'm not even sure I'm going to be here next week. It's okay. You can come back. It's all right. A king and a priest working together to bring peace. Here's my point. Hebrews has already shown us that Jesus is God's king. But now we're seeing Jesus as God's final priest. Jesus fulfills the prophecy in both roles. He is the king and the priest together. He is the Messiah and also the final priest. So that the throne of righteousness and justice and holiness also becomes the throne of grace. So that when we're pressured, when we're convicted, when we're stressed, when we're aware of our sin, when we're aware of our deep need, there is a place to go where you can find grace, that the throne of holiness is also the throne of grace. Are you with me? Here's my my one application. Um, I, I don't know if this is just because of the season of life that I'm in. If you're like a little older than me, you, maybe you can come and tell me afterwards, Dave, this is just something that happens. But... Um, one of the things that pops into my mind more and more are, are memories of where I've blown it spiritually in my life. And one of the ways where I've blown it 
uh, that have been popping into mind is, is just instances where I've been judgmental, instinctively judgmental instead of instinctively gracious. And I discover in myself that I am somewhat of a grace hoarder, that I want there to be a throne of grace for me, a lot of grace, big grace, but I am not instinctively gracious towards others. And this convicts me. It convicts me that as Christians, we can very much want grace for ourselves, and rightly so, but we also need to extend it to others. And particularly if the church will have an ongoing mission in our culture in the upcoming years, and we will because the gospel will always go forward, that the gospel will go forward to people who have grown up further away from Christian thought, Christian living, Christian lifestyle, and it's going to take a lot longer to grow spiritually. There's going to be a lot more recovery mode, so to speak, which means that as we extend the gospel of grace to others, we need to not be grace hoarders. We need to be grace conduits. Does that make sense? We say that there is a throne of grace, not just for me, but there's a throne of grace for you. How much grace? A lot of grace, which is how the rest of this passage unfolds. Because we have the how. We want, we want to hold fast and we want to draw near to the throne of grace. But how can we do this with confidence? And the preacher takes us deeper into the why question. It's almost as if under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he can anticipate the questions of the audience. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit is helping him. He, the Holy Spirit is helping him do this. That was a little rhetorical flourish for those watching online. He anticipates the congregation, thinking, well, if there's so much grace, can I really believe it? Why can I really believe that the gospel is this good? Well, we can resist drift with confidence. We can trust deeply in grace because of the ministry of the greatest high priest. He is a priest who is able to sympathize, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This word sympathize is key. And the word sympathize as it's used here is a little bit different than how we use the word sympathize. We use the word sympathize, you know, mostly in kind of a psychological understanding kind of way, or we give sympathy cards to each other. It's a little bit late on the whole Valentine's Day card quest. And so, I mean, there was one Valentine's Day card available, and there were a lot of sympathy cards available at the card. So I thought, what would it be like if I got Kim a sympathy card for Valentine's Day? We'll find out. Uh, you know, we do this. We give each other sympathy cards. And what we mean is I see that you're going through a hard time and I'm sorry for it. Or maybe I'm sure this is a hard time for you and I see it and I care. And it's polite, but it's removed from the experience. That's my point. This description of sympathy in Jesus's part is not removed from the experience it means much more because it's a compound word in the Greek and it means with plus suffer. With plus suffer. That Jesus doesn't just psychologically understand your hardship. That he just doesn't, doesn't just psychologically understand your suffering. He with plus suffers with you. He jumps into the suffering with you. What hurts you hurts him. He gets in there and he says, I sympathize with you. I am with you in this. And he's sympathetic, first of all, with our weaknesses. Weaknesses. The, the Greek word used here can describe debilitating illness incapacity, limitation, lack of confidence, feeling inadequate. Have you had any of those experiences? Weaknesses. 
weaknesses. I think we've all had those experiences. And everything in our American win-at-all-cost culture tells us that these kinds of weaknesses are weaknesses that we should be ashamed of, which is in itself dehumanizing. It's dehumanizing because being human means to have limitation. You're a finite person in a finite body, even if you are not subject to things that come into our world like illness, lack of capacity, not able to do everything, to get confused, to not know it all, to not know what to do, to lack confidence. Later on, the preacher will add sin to this list. But in this space, he says that Jesus is able to with suffer sympathize with you in your limitations. In your limitations, Jesus is able to come alongside of you and be with you. And and why would he be able to do that? Well, we know because in the incarnation, the eternal Son of God who has always existed in glory took to himself limitations that he voluntarily accepted limitations that he became incarnate in the person of a middle-class, first-century Nazarene, born into a family of a tradesman who apparently passed away at some point in his childhood or teenage years, so that Jesus knows the limitation of growing up in a single-parent home. He he knows the limitation of having to accept more responsibility for his family, perhaps, than was appropriate for him given his age. He knows the limitation of being teased by the other kids in Nazareth when he's accustomed to hearing the praise of angels. He knows the limitation of getting hungry. He knows the limitation of being tired. He knows the limitation, presumably, of getting ill. He knows everything that goes with these weaknesses, and he comes into history so that he can say to you in the 21st century, however you describe the limitation that you are experiencing, that I with suffer with you. Not just that, not, not just that I see you, which would be pretty amazing. Not just that I see you, but that I get you. I get you. The more that we believe this, I actually think we will have a radically gracious and true word to speak to our neighbors because it's exhausting to try to live up to the expectation of a life without limits. Do you, do you understand that? I mean, most of us have experienced that. But I sometimes wonder, particularly for our students, what messages our culture is sending. What well, says, you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. You can overcome any obstacle except for stealing second base because your baseball nickname is Meals for Wheels, and you got thrown out every time, I believed I could steal those bases. I visualized myself sliding in there. I heard the roar of the crowd in my mind. What I actually heard was the roar of the umpire saying, you're out. Maybe what we ought to say, since we have a priest who's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, is... Not that you can overcome every obstacle, but that some of the limitations in your life are actually gracious. That actually creates guardrails for you that God and His providence uses to direct your life. Now, that's a different sermon for a different day, or some enterprising pastor can write an article about it and we can read it later. But we have a priest 
a high priest who in his example and in his sympathy says that you can have a completely meaningful, fully human life even with limitations. That message ought to be shared more. Here's the third thing. We have a high priest who's able to deal gently with our sinning. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Same word. The emotional tenor of the priesthood ought to have been one of empathy. What's actually interesting is one of the commentators point out is there's no parallel description of an empathetic priesthood in first century Jewish writing. That in first century Jewish writing, the focus on the priesthood is on the exalted status of the high priest. The high priest was up here. Us ones were down here. But the encounter of people with Jesus and the recognition of who Jesus was and how Jesus interacted with people was such that we learned that it, it, the high priest was supposed to be empathetic, that the priest was able to deal gently with people because the priest was himself sinful, that the priest had to offer sacrifices for himself. Now, it is not the case that Jesus had to offer sacrifices for his own sin, but it is certainly the case that the emotional tenor of Jesus's priesthood is that he is able to deal gently, verse 2, with the ignorant and the wayward. Jesus changes the game here. He is different and better than the conception of the high priest in his world. Not only does he with suffer with us in his sympathy with our human frailty, he also deals gently with us in our sin, ignorant and wayward. Ignorant and wayward. They're not two descriptions of the same thing. They're actually two descriptions of two different ways of sinning. You can sin out of ignorance, right? You might not know that a law is a law, until you've broken it or read about it later. It's not maybe terribly different than some of you have had the experience driving and you didn't realize that you were driving through a reduced speed zone as you hastily made your way to work. And the officer kindly pointed out to you that the speed limit had been dropped from 60 to 35. This is all hypothetical. (laughs) And you say, thank you. I was ignorant. And he says, I don't care. (laughs) Here's the ticket. So we sin out of ignorance. Wayward describes something different. Wayward describes intentionality. The the word wayward has the same root from where we get the word planet, wanderer. Someone who chooses to wander. Wayward describes intentionality. Sometimes we overstep God's laws even when we do know better. So how does Jesus respond? Well, it's possible I could imagine him dealing gently with someone sinning out of ignorance. You know, I get it. You've got a lot to learn. You're new around here. Here's the information. I forgive you. Go and do better. But what about waywardness? How do you imagine, be honest, because you know where this is going, but be honest. How do you imagine Jesus responding? I imagine Bobby Knight. Do you remember Bobby Knight? Some of you are like, I do not know who Bobby Knight is. Bobby Knight was, well, it depends on where you grew up. Uh, Bobby Knight was a famous or infamous basketball coach. And regardless of whether you were for or against Bobby Knight, what he was famous for was his courtside temper tantrums, where he would take chairs and hurl them onto the court and yell abusive things. Can you even imagine what his, <laughs> how short his career would be now in the area of everything being mic'd up? Anyway, that's a different thought. But I, I picture these epic rants. I can't believe... 
you did that. How stupid are you? What are you doing? What kind of Christian are you? That's how I imagine it. Jesus doesn't do that. He deals gently. Deal gently is another compound word. Dane Ortland points this out in Gentle and Lowly. We'll ask him about it when he comes in May. We'll say, hey, what, what about that compound world? I, I actually checked it out. I fact-checked Dane with my Greek dictionary because we probably have the same Greek dictionary because there's only one Greek dictionary. And Dane's actually not wrong. The word means moderate or restrain on one side and suffering on the other side. You're gonna, suffering or passion. You're going to moderate your passion. So it's not that Jesus couldn't hurl the chair at you. It's that he chooses not to. He deals gently with you in your waywardness. No epic rant, no folding hurled in your direction. Intentional, moderated, self-restrained passion, gentleness. Why? Why can Jesus deal gently with our waywardness? Because he's dealt with the anger at the cross. That all of the anger, all of the chair throwing, all of the venting, all of the name calling, all of the curse spewing, all of that has already been exhausted at the cross. That that's what propitiation means. That that, that wrath, God's wrath towards our sin has been vented and it is completely done. He can deal gently with the wayward. So I want to offer you three invitations. For some of us here, you might need God to change your view of his throne. It is a throne of holiness. It is a throne of justice. It is a throne of righteousness. And it is also a throne of grace. And you need to go there. You need to go to the throne of grace and you need to ask for mercy. Some of us need to change our conception of how Jesus receives us. And some of us need to change being grace hoarders. Want the throne of grace for ourselves. But we need to also extend it to others.